Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So today I'm going to talk about an experiment that was carried out by Mizuno and his colleagues at Hokkaido University in Japan. It was involving tungsten, potassium carbonate and water and in it they estimated thermal COP of 800 times and transmutation. And this is a video which is going to be part of a series that I'm building to explain a wide range of data where transmutation has occurred and has been observed in tungsten where I am going to lead towards a review of the Marsa gas and tungsten that we ran an experiment with in Japan in 2019 and I think that you'll find when we come to that that the data is very conclusive that a Marsa gas in fact is able to do Lena, in which case it is effectively Lena in a can. Okay, so let's get to the actual presentation. This was presented at the 12th International Conference on Condensed Matter Nuclear Science, uh, 2005, in Yokohama, Japan. And the work was conducted by Tadai Hiko Mizuno and Yu Toriyabi and it was done at the Department of Engineering, Hokkaido University. I'm just going to pull out a few points. The title is Anomalous Energy Generation During Conventional Electrolysis. We experienced an explosive energy release during a conventional electrolysis experiment. A platinum mesh anode and a tungsten cathode wire, 1.5 millimeter in diameter, 20 cm long with 3 cm exposed to the electrolyte. Estimated heat out was 800 times higher than input power. There were many elements deposited on the electrode surface. The major elements were calcium and sulfur. On January the 24th, 2005, a plasma cell exploded, producing far more energy than input power can account for. They go in to describe the apparatus. So this is their typical experiment. It's not the best presentation there. But the important thing is they had a magnetic stirrer at the bottom. And I will just go through the content in this presentation um, now that's actually in the paper by Mizuno et al. And in a separate presentation I will look at exploring why it is important that one is the cathode, one is the anode, the arrangement, and the importance, I believe, of the magnetic stirrer. So the electrolyte was composed of H2O and potassium carbonate, K2CO3. And it gives the specifics there. And the discharge was enabled by an input voltage up to 350 volts. And we've done a similar experiment to these kind of experiments that were conducted by Mizuno et al., in Switzerland uh, some years ago. <laughs> so here's maybe a, a clearer image. So they had a, a Teflon cover, uh, shrinkable, uh, on the uh, cathode, uh, the tungsten rod, and that's quite useful because it limits the amount of electrode that is in contact with the water as the cathode and then the platinum anode uh, kind of going around the outside of that and that is in the electrolyte. From the hot cathode you get steam. One would expect hydrogen to be emitted from the cathode but it's also saying that there is oxygen there from pyrolysis and again this will feed into my uh, deeper analysis that I will do later. So they explain how they do the calorimetry. They have sort of a flow calorimeter and they show the equations here. Input power is only from an electric power source, although one could argue there's an extremely small amount of power input from the magnetic stirrer, but uh, that is not something I think that's going to be a concern here. Uh, even a small volume of gas generated by pyrolysis will remove a large amount of enthalpy. So they're saying that if you've got hydrogen and oxygen and it's right next to the hottest part in the reaction, these gases will be hot and as they bubble off they will remove some of the energy that is generated at the cathode. Electrode and solution. The electrode is a tungsten wire. It's 1.5 millimeters in diameter and 15 centimeters in length. 
The upper 13 centimeters of the wire is covered with shrink wrap Teflon and the bottom two centimeters is exposed. Now I've got a note here because at the top there it says three centimeters exposed and down here it says there's two centimeters exposed, but there's at least two centimeters exposed, we can uh, safely assume, to the electrolyte and acts as an electrode. During electrolysis, the sample wire was consumed. The electrolyte solution was made from high purity potassium carbonate reagent at a 0.2 molar concentration. Goes into the power supply there. Element analysis. The sample electrodes and the electrolyte were subject to element analysis by means of energy dispersion X-ray spectroscopy, EDX. Auger electron spectroscopy, AES, secondary iron mass spectroscopy, SIMS, and electron probe microanalyzer. So they really used a wide range of techniques to look at the data that came out here. It's a shame that we don't have the SIMS data for this because that should give us an idea of the isotopes that were being created, but we will work with what we have here. Mass analysis, the generated gas was continuously analyzed by a quadrupole mass spectrometer. It would have been useful to have that data as well. Maybe someone can find the data for these extra analysis techniques. I don't have them in this paper. The analyzer can measure mass numbers from 2 to 400. So in my understanding, and you will see when I look at the Parkamov tables later, there should have been a significant amount of gas generated, and it would have been useful to be able to see those. Now, in the normal experiment, they say input voltage is increased in steps from 0 volts to more than 100 volts and then decreased to a 0 volts. The input current usually rises to a maximum of 4.3 amps during conventional electrolysis with 1 centimeter squared area of tungsten electrode. But it usually decreases once plasma forms and stays around 1.6 amps, while voltage ranges from 120 to 220 volts. So this is a, a typical kind of experience. We had a similar experience that the current drops when the plasma is in the water um, because uh, there is a more efficient uh, conductor effectively in play. And so it's got some charts here about uh, the standard type of heating you would expect and uh, zoom into the active area. Explosion. So like I said, you can go and read this. I will give a link to the paper, but it's the explosion here that's the most important here. The event occurred in the first stage of the experiment before plasma normally forms. Now, it says in here that they've done this experiment extreme numbers of times, and I think the jar that they used was used for five years or something, but they've used a tungsten electrode in this case, uh, not always used a tungsten electrode. The input voltage and current were 15 volts and 1.5 amps at 40 seconds or 22.5 watts as shown in figure 6, so here. Input power was supplied for 10 seconds, so total input was roughly 300 joules. Now this is quite interesting because 300 joules is the upper end of the amount of energy that S.V. Adamenko et al. used in their elemental transmutation experiments using relativistic discharges. These are near instant discharges into a very small pure metal targets and they in fact did this with tungsten also. And in their experiments the concentration of the energy led to, in my view, exotic vacuum objects that clustered uh, into effectively a large aggregated plasmoid that then self-compressed and they argue, and I'll show you this at the end, that it didn't matter really what element they put in. They got pretty much all of the elements of the periodic table, and often they observed lead. In fact, it was almost the most common thing that they synthesized. And I've argued in previous presentations that that is because that is the heaviest element that you can synthesize that is stable. And if you go beyond there, the exotic vacuum objects will tend to cause anything above that to almost instantaneously decay back to lead. And so that's why you see a lot of lead synthesized in many Lena systems. Okay, so moving on. Within 10 seconds after turning on the power, the cell temperature began to rise steeply. It rose to 80 degrees centigrade and a bright white flash surrounded the cathode. The light expanded to the solution, and at the same instant, the cell was shattered by a sharp increase 
of inner pressure. The explosion blew off the plexiglass safety door and spread shards of Pyrex glass and electrolyte up to five to six meters into the surrounding area. I have seen another article that said that there was some minor injury to Mizuno and the visitor during this event. So um, one needs to respect uh, this technology, um, especially when one is using tungsten. I've also talked about where David Hudson was investigating high current short discharges with tungsten electrode into a copper plate. So the cathode again here was tungsten with ormus or monoatomic gold on the crucible and basically the tungsten instantaneously disappeared. And I've given in a number of examples of disappearing tungsten in a video of the same name, which you can see on our channel. Anyway, uh, moving on. So there's this extremely rapid rise in temperature of the water. The flow of hydrogen gas from the cell increased just before the explosion to levels higher than the current could have produced from electrolysis. This extra hydrogen came from pyrolysis caused by the intense heat. The magnetic stirrer ensures that the fluid is well mixed with a uniform temperature. The three separate RTDs in the electrolyte all recorded between 70 degrees and 80 degrees just before the explosion. And he has a table here where you have the last four data points and you can see uh, the thermal incline is not there. 15 seconds, it's basically not there. There's a, there is a little bit of a thermal incline there. A thermal gradient appeared in the last few seconds, but the entire 700 milliliter volume of water was heated from 25 degrees C to at least 70 degrees C during this short period of time. We estimate that the reaction produced 800 times more energy than was input into the cell prior to the explosion. Now this is interesting because if we look at the work of S.V. Adamenko in the Proton 21 labs outside of Ukraine in the early 2000s, he, as I said earlier, he used between 100 and 300 joules in his experiments and they calculated that they observed energy yield in not just in terms of thermal excess but also particulates uh, and tra transmutation, so alpha particles all kinds of radiation coming out of those experiments. And they estimated that the yield was 10,000 times. So this is almost the same amount of input energy, and they are claiming 800 thermal times more energy than the electrical energy in. So there is plenty of room for this claim to be valid when comparing to that observed by Adamenko et al. Now, it is likely that the platinum mesh anode catalyzed the hydrogen and oxygen to recombine rapidly in the electrolyte, triggering the explosion in the headspace, but this cannot explain all of the energy released. Elements on the electrode surface. There were many elements deposited on the electrode surface. The major elements were calcium and sulfur. Now I can say that we have observed large abundances of calcium synthesized uh, and sulfur uh, synthesized with a Mars gas and a tungsten rod. And as I say, I, I presented some of that data in my ICCF22 um, poster presentation, and I will do a much more detailed presentation that I'm, I'm currently working on. But uh, calcium has been found in very many Lena systems, and I have argued that this is because it is deck alpha, and that the system seems to want to produce alpha particles, and uh, this, for me, and my understanding, as I've explained earlier, is like the densest packing of nucleons uh, in the physical vacuum. Uh, and this is something that I learned from Stoyan Sargachev. And if it's a boson, which it is, then matter can occupy that same location over and over again. So if you're packing things into a small box, you will want to create uh, a lot of bosons. Now, sulfur... Uh, so we've seen this observed in several systems that, that we've looked at, like the flux tubes in the Lion reactor that synthesized calcium. Now in the case of sulfur, we observed that also in a Mars gas, 
in snowballs on cobblestone. So go and have a look at that video on our YouTube channel. Anyway, moving on. So they're seeing calcium and sulfur, and here's the view of the electrode here. And what they did is they analyzed two areas. They analyzed the tip area here with EDX, and they analyzed a side area where there seemed to be some effect going on. So this is a, a, an unused uh, electrode here. So here's the spectrum, which is a normal spectrum for tungsten before the experiment. And then here is the data after the experiment where you can see uh, the predominant spikes are for calcium and sulfur. There's potassium there, but of course potassium is in the electrolyte, so that's not a surprise. Now, the slides that were given in 2005 are also in this presentation. They add some extra detail, so I will go through these now. So to reiterate again here, the key points are that you have a 10 second input of around about 300 joules. That's the electrical input power. The thermal power estimated out is about 800 times that. Uh, and then the observed elements deposited on the electrode surface with the major elements being calcium and sulfur. Now, I did say that this was deck alpha, but of course sulfur, if you get two oxygens, they are... 16 and they go to uh, um, sulfur which is sulfur 32 oxygen is effectively quad alpha and sulfur is effectively oct alpha so they're essentially made of alpha conjugate nuclei now in this case and they note that they used a one liter pyrex glass i think they had 700 milliliters in there but anyway pyrex as we've known before contains uh, boron and boron could be um, interacting with the uh, strange radiation that should, in my view, be emitted from an event such as this. And I'd like to remind people that when I did the video on disappearing tungsten, David Hudson said that when he had his tungsten electrode disappear, that outside of the arc furnace and at a, some distance away, they had glass uh, jars on shelves in the laboratory and that these were damaged and they kind of fell apart so it does appear that there could be some uh, weakening and of the structure of uh, quartz or silicon dioxide especially if it has uh, boron in it and with what the interactions are um, are to be discussed at another time but of course we had quartz in the lion reactor and that was uh, strongly affected also by what came out of the core of the Lion reactor. Platinum mesh, the cathode was tungsten at a 99.9% .9 purity, and the temperature at starting was 20 degrees. The event occurred in the first stage of the experiment before plasma normally forms. So it's not saying it didn't form, but it's saying it's before it normally forms. And they saw a bright white flash. We observed similar sort of flashes in the Suhas Ralkar discharges when we were looking at his technology in India in 2017. So here's the overall view of the experiment. You've got the cell here, pyrometer uh, over here. You have your RTDs in there measuring the temperature, flow meter, power meter, and power supply. So this is the jar effectively before. And uh, you can see the platinum electrode in there, and you can see where the tungsten's coming down and, and the um, flow calorimetry and other RTD sensors and so forth. Now, they've drawn the stages of what happened in the next few slides, and I think this is quite interesting. So, firstly, they see this kind of like the typical kind of sparky discharges or events you see where it's kind of like yellow and it's just mostly around the electrode and there's sometimes things flying about in there that you will see in the work of Ken on Lena Form. He's doing some excellent work and you will see if you go and look at his work in the Mandaini type studies you will see these kind of effects. Now very quickly bearing in mind this was only a few seconds you can see that what they've drawn here is something that looks quite a lot like a ball lightning and I would be surprised if it wasn't essentially a ball lightning being built and so if we go 
further we can see here that it's getting kind of more intense and there's some cracks coming in here so remember what i said about david hudson when the tungsten exploded in his electric furnace and here the cracks become very severe and then it just exploded with shards going everywhere into the laboratory this is the aftermath and uh, you can see that things went straight down and out and i guess this is the plastic or polycarbonate or shield that was in front of the overall system and that's being shifted off to one side. I would love to have been able to examine this uh, material here and in fact other materials in there to see if there were any signs of strange radiation tracks. Anyway it's another picture after the explosion. Now again this is this picture of the electrodes. This is the tip of the electrode and I'm going to show you something by Me356 which looks quite a lot like this and in fact if you go on our YouTube channel there is a video of that sample which I will put the link for in the description of this video. Now this for me is extremely interesting because we can see there's a kind of blown out feature. It's kind of blown out. This is the striations of the uh, maybe the extrusion process for producing the tungsten before it's sintered or so something like that. Um, but anyway, you have this exploded area out. So it actually says exploded. And when you look at the tungsten that I will sh show you in great detail from our work with Amaza gas and tungsten in Japan in 2019, you will see this kind of thing, but on a much greater scale. And it is interesting that for it to explode out, whatever was exploding out had to be kind of under the surface to a degree. And I will walk through how I believe that occurs and why it occurs. Note that they have a, a sample area here which they are next zooming into. So that sample area is here, so they've got a much more magnified image of that. And this is where they're saying there's more hydrogen coming out that you would normally get from this kind of process by electrolysis. Uh, this is the point where you see this very large rise in temperature of the electrolyte. Input and output changes before explosion. So you've got your input energy and it's logarithmic here. So you've got your output energy. So this is the normal tungsten as we showed before. It's a little bit zoomed in. And then this is a overview of the exploded tip. And again, you see the calcium and sulfur generated. The potassium is in the mix overlaid onto the tungsten signal. And this is again for the exploded side, that section on the side. And you see here silicon as well as the sulfur and the calcium. But they go in to look at this in extra detail because the sort of minor synthesized elements are in here. And what they observed was the sulfur, obviously the potassium's there before calcium is there, but they got titanium, barium, cerium, neodymium, samarium, iron, cobalt, and copper. That's quite a broad spread. And they have a theory called the TSC mechanism. And this is basically where you have either two deuterons or four protons, and they form a tetrahedral structure. And this is kind of the active thing that goes in to transmute the elements that are involved. And they have a number of pages here where they go and explain the energy yield and the interaction of various isotopes of tungsten with, in this case, a tetrahedral condensed structure of four protons. And so they talk about the synthesis. And you note here that they've got argon here and they've got xenon. And you can see here there is xenon again and argon and here you can see there is xenon as well. So they can arguably say that they can observe all of the synthesized elements using this mechanism, but there are things that we don't know which we don't see um, in the data that is presented because they haven't shared all of the data from the analysis techniques they used. So in conclusion, they estimated 800 times more thermal output than electricity input based on the data recorded before explosion. And we can say that that is plausible given the data from the same kind of input energies in the Adamenko et al. experiments and the output energies where they claim to have observed around 10,000 times more energy, but across all of the forms of transmutation and, and, and types of rays and particle emissions, as well as thermal 
from their experiments at Proton 21. The major detected elements were silicon, sulfur, calcium, titanium, iron, chromium, and copper. Minor elements were barium, cerium, neodymium, gadolinium, samarium, and cobalt. So the TCS mechanism seems to be a, a, a suitable explanation for this. What I've done here is I have a, a little blog post of which this video will become part of. If we use the MFMP's nucleon exchange reaction calculator, which is at nanosoft.co.nz 2 to 2 PHP, and we input just potassium uh, as uh, an element 1 and uh, the element 2 as potassium and tungsten, so you can see the inputs here. You can see there are 333 outputs. The elements we get are all of the elements that they observed and then some. So here I have run a tighter query here where I've still got potassium and potassium and tungsten as element one and element two. They are kind of the reaction products going in. So here I have element three, and what I'm saying is that element three are the lighter elements that are observed. So I've got sulfur, silicon, calcium, titanium, iron, copper, cobalt. And then element four, I'm requesting that it would be barium, cerium, neodymium, samarium, and gadolinium. And so I put those in because typically the lighter elements appear as element three, and the heavier elements in the products appear as element four. Now, this would be a progressive process. This is only two re to two nuclei to nuclei, and the actual reaction could be very many interactions that happen in a very short period of time. This actually gives us 154 responses, and if we go to the elements that are synthesized, you see silicon, sulfur, potassium, calcium, titanium, chromium, iron, copper, neodymium, samarium, gadolinium, and tungsten. Basically, all of the elements are easily synthesized just by the use of potassium and tungsten. So here we can see a page from Controlled Nuclear Synthesis Breakthroughs in Experiment and Theory by S.V. Adamenko et al., Proton21 Labs. Here's the typical target in grayscale on the SEM. And here he is saying that they used 100 to 300 joules of energy. And he's again saying here it doesn't matter what targets they had, whether it was made of magnesium, blah, 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 blah all the way through to tungsten here. It didn't matter what they had. Um, there is no relation between the element composition of products of the target matter transformation and that of the initial target or materials used in manufacturing the setup details. This is the case for his work because he's getting to the point of such intense, in my view, EVO activity that it's causing a self-compression. So many of them are coming together and it's just crushing the whole body of nucleons in like a kind of a supernova kind of event. And you will get kind of supernova outputs as observed by him and Leclerc in water cavitation. If you want to get a preview of presentation topics I am developing or experimental and theoretical concepts I am considering alongside other topics I think you would be interested in, please consider subscribing to my newsletter and podcast at remoteview.icu. References discussed in this video are given in its description as are ways you can help support the work that the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project does. Thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.